we have given out a folder uh, of Because we're here new today, we started this folder. This uh, take uh, last time. Well, so um, and, Uh, <clears throat> we actually started this last week, uh, and this um, gives us the introduction to our 39 carry bodies of what is considered work. So we explained that uh, in, the, in the Ten Commandments, it says not to do any work on Shabbos. Um, the definition, as uh, a special definition, as Hashem told Moshe Rabbeinu, this is a part of Torah Shabbat Peh, part of the oral law explaining the Torah. And it was explained that there are 39 categories of activities that are forbidden to do on Shabbos, and all of these 39 categories are a part of the building of the Mishkan, the house for Hashem, while it was in the desert, it was a portable sanctuary, a portable Beis Hamikdash. So all of the 39 categories that are a part of the building of the Mishkan, the Torah tells us that Shabbos is to be kept and not to build the Mishkan. And the example would be, would be uh, we're building the king's palace, and then there's a day that the king is talking to us and invites us to the palace where one would concentrate and focus completely on the king and not to do all the works that are needed for the building of the palace. So we have the listing of the 39 categories here. And they're part of the preparation of the dyes, preparation of the wool materials, preparation of the skins, construction of the beams, putting up the sanctuary, welding, doing the finishing touches. And we have the 39 categories. There is the major one that is listed. And then there are the toldos, the offsprings that are all Torah prohibitions. For example, the locker that we're going to be covering first is called sewing, S-O-W, not S-E-W. S-O-W is putting a seed in the ground. That would be the av malacha. Zareya, putting a seed in the ground is the av malacha. However, all other activities that are a part of planting are Torah prohibitions. Whether it is putting a seed in the ground, or whether it is putting a plant in the ground or promoting growth. Even if something is already growing, making it grow better is also a Torah prohibition as a part of this category. So we have sowing is the av, that is the principle. And then we have everything else that promotes growth that is also a total prohibition. They're called told us, they're called the offspring, those are called the children. So watering a plant on Shabbos would be a part of this Malacha Torah prohibition. Then there are the 
Torah tells us to make safeguards. Asu siyogla Taira, make a fence around the Torah to make sure that the Torah will be kept and not to do an activity that might lead to a Torah prohibition. And those are called the rabbinic prohibitions. Last week we were we elaborated that many of them begin after the first this, this, after the destruction of the first base on Bigdash and coming back to Eretz Yisrael 70 years later, the times of Mordechai, Esther, the times of Ezra. So Ezra was the leader and he saw that Shabbos was very lax. And therefore, he made a lot of safeguards that to show and to practice the sanctity of the Shabbos. So the rabbinic prohibitions are a Torah commandment to follow the rabbis. We have the the Torah studies that we gave out. It shows where the, the Sanhedrin got its authority. But the Torah tells us that since the Sanhedrin was next to the Beis Hamikdash, and therefore halacha means how does Hashem want us to conduct ourselves? So Hashem said that He will give the insight to the Sanhedrin they should come to the right conclusions and to make the safeguards that are needed for the Jewish people. So the rabbinic prohibitions, the Torah tells us not to turn away from their right or left. So the Torah gives them the authority and gives them the backing. So when it comes to the 39 categories, this is on um, rabbinic prohibitions, the page that has rabbinic prohibitions. This is the... Um, so we have uh, an activity that resembles a malacha. And the um, example that's given here is that um, squeezing juice from grapes is a Torah prohibition. All other fruits and vegetables is considered another form of the fruit and vegetable. It's not considered an independent liquid. So only wine and olive oil are considered a new entity and making wine or olive oil on Shabbos is a Torah prohibition. But as far as we're concerned, making orange juice seems to be very similar to making grape juice. Therefore, people will become confused and people might, if they were accustomed to making fresh orange juice on Shabbos, it might lead to the next step that when they want to have a fresh um, grape juice, it might come to that. So the Rabbanon made a prohibition in squeezing fruits and vegetables that are normally used for its liquid. And the details we will go into when we are actually going to be learning this. Then we have, on the bottom of the page, Maris Ayin. There are certain activities that the viewer will assume that a prohibited action was done. And the example would be, if you see someone on Shabbos hanging the wash, close pins, put it on the line, what would you assume? That it was washed on Shabbos. Washing garments on Shabbos is a Torah prohibition. Now, you see the uh, person who is hanging the clothes on the line on Shabbos. So what, you don't know that actually it's, they wipe their hands on the towel on Shabbos, they weren't washing it, they just want to put it out to dry. That's what actually happened. So wiping your hands on a towel is permissible. When you have in the Chal Yahadis, you have 20 girls, 50 girls, 60 girls using the same towel <laughs> eventually. It's going to become pretty, pretty saturated with water. So if one were to, so no one washed it, actually it became dirty. That's clean. It's the opposite. But anyway, someone now hangs it out on the line to dry. What will the person who does not know the history of this towel, what will they think? Someone could assume that it was washed on Shabbos. Now, the person who, hang, who did the hanging, what will you think about this person? One of two things. Either person is transgressing Shabbos, 
he's not a Shabbos observer, or you're allowed to do it. If your Rebetzin did it, then everybody could do it because it must be a permissible thing to, to wash and, and put out things in the Shabbos. So therefore, this is called Malus Ayin. This is called uh, not to do an activity that might bring people to the wrong conclusion. And that also uh, carries over in, in other in other situations as well. Um, we spoke about this last week that uh, at a time when the non-dairy creamer, something that is part of us, something that could be eaten with either milk or, 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 or meat, we have the um, almond, um, almond um, milk or the uh, oat milk, all the different, different um, types of creams that are non-dairy. So if it is being served at, at, at one point, this was something that was new. And if it would be served after a meal of meat, or you have the power of ice cream, that they do a good job and it, it tastes exactly like the dairy ice cream. So you were to eat it, and you were to see it's being served, so what would you say about this meal? One or two things. Either you're not keeping pastures because they're serving dairy after meat, or that maybe you can't eat it together, but after the bench, then you could have ice cream or, or milk and coffee. So in order to prevent this, this is called Maris eye and what the eye sees and assumes. So then initially when this came out, they made the only hashgachas, everything else, the rule was if you're serving a non-dairy cream, a creamer or, or ice cream or margarine, it had to be in its wrapper, it had to be in its container. So everyone who sees it being served, they see that it is a non-dairy product. So this is something that is Maris Ayan to be concerned. A person going into a restaurant that's not kosher, question according to the circumstances, that would be also something that is Maris Ayan. People who are observing see a religious person going into a non-kosher restaurant. Again, one would have to learn the laws of what could and can't be done going into such a, 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 such a place. <clears throat> so what is the source for this? In, uh, in the Torah sources, I, in, this, in this page, the last page of this uh, booklet, which is the sources for the authority, we have the Torah tells us that uh, when the people, this is uh, the, the one that, that has the Torah authority. So it says that um, Jewish people were ready to cross into the Jordan and the tribe of God, Ruvain, say that they want to stay on the other side of the Jordan, that they, want to, they do not want to cross over. Uh, they'll cross over to the other side of the Jordan. And the people are going to say that you are afraid to cross over because the enemy is so strong, you are frightened, and now everyone will become frightened, and no one will want to cross over as was done 40 years before that. So they said, no, we're going to build uh, cities for our families, and we're going to arm ourselves, and we're going to be in the front of the battle. So Moshe says, if you do this thing, you will arm yourselves before Hashem for the battle, and every armed man among you will cross the Jordan before Hashem. He drives out the enemy before him. So then you will be vindicated from Hashem and from Israel, which in Hebrew reads, the yis and the kiyim will be innocent, may Hashem, in Hashem's eyes, and Yisrael in the eyes of Israel. So therefore the Torah tells us we are concerned about what other people, conclusions that people will come to. So this is something that we, the Torah tells us to take that into consideration. So this is when it comes to Shabbos, some of the prohibitions are connected with the uh, Then we have activities, back again to this booklet, activities that can lead to a transgression of a Torah prohibition. And um, that would be um, the laws of muktza. Are you familiar with the term muktza? Muktza means not to move something that is forbidden to use on Shabbos. So 
One of the ideas is, let's say there's a hammer. A hammer is used for work. Therefore, moving a hammer on Shabbos is forbidden unless it is for permissible activity, which we will elaborate on. But if generally just moving a hammer is forbidden because a hammer is normally used for work, therefore handling that might lead you to work. So that would be some of the safeguards that the Rabbanan put in place. Same thing would also be we could not make use of a tree. Climbing a tree, sitting in the branch of a tree. The reason is, what safeguard is there? You're sitting in a tree. There are the leaves. And you might, same thing would be also smelling the fruits that's growing on a tree. So then smelling the fruit, smells so delicious. Pick it, shots. Uh, however, I just want to mention, I think we mentioned it last time, is also as far as flowers are concerned, you are permitted to go to the botanical gardens and uh, make a bracha before the fragrant flowers. There's a special bracha that is said before smelling something that is a fragrant. The general bracha is that we make um, on the Shabbos on the spice. So we are permitted to on Shabbos to smell, enjoy the fragrance of the flowers because we don't assume that the person is going to pick the flowers. Uh, however, when it comes to a fruit, a person who has a fruit tree, go out, see something that's nice, ripe, take it off, and that would be their, that's how they would do it in the weekday. So that would be uh, one of the safeguards that are, uh, that are done. Um, another example that they give here is a safeguard would be when you're putting something on the, to, uh, to, to keep warm for Shabbos, we keep that on a warmer block. In a case where there is a fire, where we cover up the fire, we'll be learning about that in detail. And if something is not completely cooked, moving it close to the fire, picking up the lid and putting it on the lid, on hasten the cooking, the stirring hasten the cooking, so if something is completely raw, we assume you're not going to handle it because it's not going to be ready until the next day. So there's no purpose in trying to make it cook faster. Something that is edible at night, even though you plan to eat it the next day, but since it's edible at night, it's smells so good, delicious, you might decide that you want to have it at night as well. And anyone have any of the, uh, the ch night, night chant? <laughs> Right, right, and I had a little challenge. But anyway, uh, if you do want, you, you do see that it's almost ready, but not quite, you still want to have it at night, so then you might do something that's going to hasten the cooking, move it a little close to the fire, stir it a little, or something of that sort. So therefore, they said either it's completely raw and will not be able to be eaten at night at all, or it's fully cooked, in case you do want to eat it, and it's out. So that would be one of the safeguards. Then we have another uh, category that is restricted. That's at the bottom of the page, preserving the sanctity of Shabbos. So even if there's no malacha, if it's not in the spirit of Shabbos, there's also a restriction. And that would be an example, is checking one's business affair, going through um, the, uh, the stocks, on Shabbos to see how they're doing. These are all weekday activities that is not in the spirit of Shabbos. So that also would, is a restriction. Let's take an example. You have something that they put out now that is uh, called uh, um, a Shabbos wheelchair. That's, that, 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 that's uh, automatic. But they have a heksha on it, you know, maybe used on Shabbos. So people who are in that, in that situation, <clears throat> in that situation, so they would have to check with their rabbinic authority, should they use it on Shabbos or not? Can they go to shul with it or not? I'm just in the place of an Arab. They're not going to that. But I just want to take it a step further. What happens if they put out uh, a car that's completely um, fit to be used on Shabbos? Well, they, right now, they don't have it yet, but let's say they do come up with a car that is fit to be used on Shabbos. 
can you drive, should one drive in a car on Shabbos that is, uh, you know, that is uh, not transgressing anything directly on Shabbos? Should one use a car on Shabbos? What would that, what would that mean? You know, what, what would be the attitude when you, uh, is that a Shabbos activity? Even if, even if it would be halakhically permissible, still it's not the spirit of Shabbos. There are certain things that might be permissible, but if it's not the spirit of Shabbos, one should not do that activity. So these are some of the safeguards that are on it made. Number one, it resembles a Torah prohibition. It might lead to a Torah prohibition. It is something that is not the Shabbos spirit. And it's also something that doing an activity that might lead for people to suspect that you that the that Shabbos transgression was done. So these are the safeguards that the government enacted. And this was also um, done by the Anshik Nesadil, the men of the Great Assembly. The, the uh, initial laws were passed by the men of the Great Assembly, which would include uh, Daniel, Mordechai, uh, the prophets. So you had 120 members who were the leading authorities in the, in the Jewish people at that time when they came back in the beginning of the building of the Beis Hamikdash. So the, the miracle of Purim took place in the creation of the world 3404. Four years later, 3408, they were permitted to complete the building of the Beis Hamikdash by the Persian government. So, um, so at that time you have these enactments, and they made many enactments. The Ezra, our davening, comes from that. Um, some of the enactments. The um, if one is going to bake bread, they should bake it early in the morning, in order that someone who is needy comes by and is hungry will be able to give them something to eat. Um, those who are selling perfumes and uh, women's jewelry, they're not, they, they, they're not permitted to do it only in the big cities. They also have to have representatives that are going to go to the towns and villages to enable the women that they should be able to have the perfumes and jewelry. So this is the word to so I'm looking at Kashi Knesset Del, it wasn't only for, you know, the, between Hashem and, and, and man, but also between man and man, they also made different enactments to enhance the family life. Not to do the, uh, another one was not to do the laundry on Friday. One or two things. You know, if you, at, at, at one point, doing the laundry was very, very a major, it was a day's work. You took it down to the water. Does anyone know about the scrubbing board? Scrubbing board? So that was, they didn't have the washing machine, so everything was a scrubbing board. So yeah, scrubbing board, then you had to beat it. And they had to wring it and put it out to dry. It was a major thing. So then you would either you would spend your time doing the laundry and not being able to take the other preparations for Shabbos, or at that point you would not have any clean clothes for Shabbos because you left it for Friday and Friday we're not able to do it. It wasn't time to, time to dry. So they made an enactment that laundry should not be done on Friday; it should be done before before Friday. So this is also something that comes come from the same Ezra and Shikhnas Agdolo. And they were also trying to see that since one should wear Shabbos clothes um, to enable people to be able to, to, to have clean clothes for Shabbos. And that would be also the rule that we dress special for Shabbos. Even if one is not going anywhere, they're staying in their home, they should not go, you know, go around in their, in their robe, but rather they should wear Shabbos clothes in the honor of Shabbos, that we have the Shabbos Queen comes to our house, we dress and act in a special way. Therefore, it's Mitzvah also to we have the covered Shabbos, the Onik Shabbos, the honor of Shabbos, and the and enjoyment of Shabbos. So, Okay, so um, I think the booklet that I gave out, the last page, 
was about the enjoyment of Shabbos, or if not, so, okay. So um, we have the last page, which is some of the um, terms that are used for, for Shabbos. Uh, the, um, <coughs> Speak from the <clears throat> so we have a passage from Isaiah from the Shayot and Prophets who says that in Tosh Shabbos Lech if you restrain your feet from uh, going places that are not the Shabbos spirit because of Shabbos. Attending to your affairs that are mundane weekday affairs and my holy day, not to do business, not to read your mail, not to look at your business accounts, not to see your checkbook, to see how many if you, you have to if you ran out of money or not. All these things are even though there is no, you know, you're not doing the malacha, but it's not the Shabbos spirit because you are taken away from the Shabbos sanctity. And you will call the Shabbos delights. So this is called Onik Shabbos. That would include that you make you, you get yourself special foods that you that you enjoy, uh, <clears throat> and that would be a part of the mitzvah of Onik Shabbos. That actually is a mitzvah. You should enjoy the Shabbos by having special foods. Um, and there's also the Dush Hashem Bechubad and honor the day. Says the from doing your customary ways that are weekday, refrain from pursuing your affairs, speaking profane things. So, this is also covered Shabbos, would be making the house tidy for Shabbos, cleaning up the Shabbos, so it's a mitzvah, cleaning the house for Shabbos, anything be dusting, should be dusted, uh, washing the floor, setting the table, putting the tablecloth, even if you're not going to be eating. On this, you know, you're going out, but still the table should be with a tablecloth to show um, a festive, a festive uh, atmosphere. Also, we have the lighting of the Shabbos candles. It has two things: it's the honor of Shabbos. So even if we're not eating, we still would light the candles. Same thing as on Yom Kippur, we light the candles, even though we're not eating, but it is in the honor of Yom Kippur. And um, the also, the, it's also delight. It's, to, it's, it's a candlelight dinner. If you didn't try the candlelight, it's something that enhances the uh, atmosphere for Shabbos. So doing that is a mitzvah. So having Onik Shabbos, Kabbalah Shabbos, the honor of Shabbos, washing up, grooming myself. If someone needs a haircut, do it in the honor of Shabbos. Someone needs to, to groom their, to, to uh, take care of their nails, do it. So in Shabbos, it should be. So this is all on in the honor of Shabbos. Um, Washing oneself for Shabbos this is all a part of a mitzvah. So it's easy to get a lot of mitzvahs for Shabbos doing things that are enjoyable, at the same time also getting credit for that. So Hashem says, as a as a as a, as a as a reward, you will delight in the Lord, and I will make you ride on high places in the earth, and I will nourish you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, and you will have be blessed because you kept the Shabbos. And um, for Rosh Hashanah, it is determined our earnings for the year. How much we will be earning for the year and uh, where the money will go. As someone who could be, so there, there's, a, there's a lot of things that are done honestly. If anyone adds dishonestly in any way, so that money goes away for negative things. So the washing machine breaks, the roof uh, leaks, the, uh, the car crashes. All these things are, you know, that that could have been avoided because that money was not allotted for the extra things. So, so it is determined how much you should earn for shop for for the, for the whole year. However, there's a separate account that is not a part of what is going to be given on Rosh Hashanah. And that is the expenditures that you spend. For Shabbos, specifically for Shabbos, that would include the foods that you buy 
the clothes that you buy for Shabbos. So Hashem says, that's on his account. You're putting out the money, but he's going to make sure throughout the year you're going to be getting addition that was not allotted to you on Rosh Hashanah. This comes from a separate account that will be given to you to for that which you spend for Shabbos, for Yantif, and for Rosh Chodesh. You're going to make a special Rosh Chodesh meal that also is on Hashem's account. And also for education. So Jewish education. So that also, money's not you spend, Hashem will make sure that that comes from the special account that you will be compensated throughout the year. Okay, so with the last page has a bit of the 39, the terms for the 39 malachas. Does everyone have that? Um, okay. So we have um, we have the terms for the thirty nine malachas. This page, the last page of the booklet. So we have the word malacha and avoda. Malacha is what is forbidden on Shabbos. Avoda, work, labor, that is not of the Torah prohibition. It may not be in the spirit of Shabbos, but it's not a Torah prohibition. So, uh, so take, take for instance, you have this table that is very, very heavy. And uh, you're having um, Onik Shabbos in the next room, and you need an extra table. Are you allowed to carry this heavy table from this room to the next room, even though whoever is carrying it is really going to exert a lot of, a lot of energy? Are you allowed to do it? Yes, no? Yes. It's not, it's, 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 a, it's a permissible thing, you're using it for Shabbos. You're not, uh, so in that case, it is permissible, even though it is labor, because you worked up a lot of energy, spraining your muscles, but that's not the prohibited. The malacha is a definition that a forbidden activity Shabbos is not different. So for instance, um, make the fire. Fire is not labor. It's very easy to strike a match, have a, a, a lighter. So it's not the labor that's involved. It is the malacha, making the fire. Same, same as also carrying. You're carrying something light, you're carrying your keys, you're carrying your, your purse, you're carrying your, your, your keys, carrying the tissue. That's not labor, but it is a malacha because you're transferring from private domain to a public domain or carrying in the <laughs> and uh, in the Torah sentences, those who just came, I'll try to, I think downstairs I have more of the handouts. So there we have that there are certain malachas that the Torah specifically states that it would include making a fire, even though in the times of the of the midbar when the Jewish people in the desert make the fire was the same as striking the match. They had something that was called a tinder box. That is what was used in Egypt. You had a box with a flint, you just struck it, and you had a fire right there. It wasn't that you had to stand with a, you know, a string and try to get uh, friction and, and these things. It was very, very easy to make a fire then. So it wasn't the labor that was involved, it was rather baking. So Torah tells us not to, not to cook, not to bake. Torah tells us not to carry. We were told that on Shabbos they should not go and collect the man, the heavenly food, because they're taking from their home, going into public domain, taking the man, and then bringing that back to them. We're also told not to make any donations on Shabbos. You're leaving your home, bringing the donation to the public place where the nations were gathered. So the Torah specifically tells you about not carrying. And then again, that, that's it, it, not necessarily is there anything that is heavy. So it's not labor, it's just that look. The Torah also tells you not to plow, to prepare the earth for planting and not to reap, to cut that which is growing. Those are the blocks that the Torah actually of the 39 categories, those are the ones that are actually stated. So <clears throat> now also Malachas Machsheves is a thought out work, an act of craftsmanship as was done in the construction of the Mishkan that served the Jewish people in the desert. So it's your intention 
that also determines if a malacha was done, a thought out work. So for instance, there is something that is a vegetable that's on the ground. And you assume that it is not attached to the ground. But then you pull it, and guess what? It was growing in the ground. Parrots. <laughs> what a malacha done? Are you are you liable for that? No. Because it's not malach machshev. It was not a thought out work. Your intention was to pick up the carrots. You were not aware that it was in it was growing still. So in that case, it was not a thought out work. You were not deliberately trying to remove a carrot from its place of growth. So it was not a thought out work, and therefore that work was not done. Another an example. You're, uh, you're walking by the light switch and you move against it and the light goes on or off, which one? One of the two. Do you have to do tshuva for that? Why? Because it's not a thought out work. Your intention was not in any way to switch, to split the switch. However, if you forgot it was Shabbos and you flipped the switch, then a malaf was done. You knew exactly you, you were deliberately trying to open or close the light. That is a malaf. That was a thought out work, even though it was not thought out to transgress the Shabbos. But that is a malaf. And therefore, something of that sort, if this is something that you. So for Shabbos, there is something that they have these magnet. Here in the Corona Heist, is, we have all kinds of Shabbos, um, Shabbos, uh, Shabbos, Shabbos uh, helps and other places I think you'll find it. But there's a little magnet thing that goes over the white light switch. And it's, uh, so you will not, you will remember that, um, that, it's, um, that it's Shabbos. You will not come to, to open and close it. So uh, now we have Malachi de Raisa. Oraisa is our Aramaic. In Hebrew, it's Torah. In Aramaic, it's Oraisa. And the reason why they use it is because we're taking from the Talmud. The Talmud was written in Aramaic. So this is terms that Malachi de Raisa, Torah forbidden activity. And then we have Malachi de number five is Malachi de Rabbanan, a rabbinic forbidden activity. Lamates, Malachas, Lamed is every he, a letter in Hebrew has a numerical value. Lamed is 30. Tes is 9. Same purpose, done in a different manner. Watering a plant is a told of planting, which is the um, which is the principal one. Psikresha. Psikresha means in an unintentional act, but will result but will result definitely to be a malacha. Dragging a heavy bench across a field that will plow the field. Another example would be you have as the refrigerators have a light. You open the door, there's a switch in the door. You open the door. The switch opens up. You close the door, the switch closes. So a person wants to get something from the refrigerator, a nice, the covered Shabbos kindness to the light in the Shabbos. They want to have some, some juice to the refrigerator. So your intention is not to light up the refrigerator. Your intention is to get the juice. However, knowing that there's a light there, you definitely know that when opening the door, the light will go on. So even though that's not your intention, but it's a psychation, it's something that you can't remove the head of something and still accept it to, expect it to live. It's psychation. So therefore, doing that, even though it's not intentional to open the light, but you are definitely opening the light, therefore, that would be forbidden. That would be as if you're opening up the light deliberately. So even though you don't want the light, but 
that is the action that is going to that, that makes it happen. Okay, so uh, we have Malach Mashebes. Uh, that, that now they have, in order to be a total prohibition, it must meet the following conditions. Dovish is Kaben, something that's intentional, like we gave the example, your intent is to pick something, not to pick it up. Kedarkam. If, if an act that is done in its usual manner is a Torah prohibition, and when it's done in an unusual manner, then it would be rabbinic. So an example. An example would be writing is done with your hand that's, that's dominant, whatever your writing hand is. Writing with the other hand is not considered a Torah, a Torah prohibition, but it is rabbinic because you are writing. So it would make a difference to know if it's rabbinic or Torah, whether we're, we're in a situation where you have the option of, it has to be done, for instance, someone has to, in the hospital, someone has to be treated, they will not accept the patient unless someone signs for it. If you're able to convince them that it'll be done after Shabbos, that's the first way to go. If it can't be done and it's an emergency, then you have to sign. In that case, they tell you, how should you sign? Sign with your left hand. In that case, it's rabbinic. So doing it the right hand would be a Torah prohibition. If you have the option of being to do it with the left hand, one would do it with the left hand. That would be one of the things. Someone has to go to the hospital, they have to take a cab. You can't carry the money, put it in your shoe. That would be rabbinic. That's not the way you carry money. Unless you carry that with the way. But anyway, so these would be some of the examples I'm trying to say. What, why do we, what, why, what, you know, what difference does it make with rabbinic or, or, or Torah? They're both prohibited, but there are certain situations where the Kabbana to begin with made their exceptions, agencies, and circumstances. Okay, so this is my next lesson is going to be actually from the textbook. So we'll be starting the book, our next session. Yeah, if it's possible to come in the Okay, I'm just looking through the names of uh, Shuli.
And uh, your language? Hungarian. Yeah, okay. You able to follow? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah.